Whole Foods Market has you covered all winter long with next-level finds for any occasion. Score big for game day with your favorite selection of hard-to-find beer, party platters, and winning appetizers. From their prepared foods to wallet-happy goodies. From 365 by Whole Foods Market, it's all good. And for those nights when you just want to cozy up and have a romantic dinner at home, there's no place better to shop. From roses to animal welfare certified meat, level up all your winter plans at Whole Foods Market. It's another edition of the Terry's Talking Podcast. Welcome to this week's. I'm David Campbell, your host, sports manager at Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer, and joined just off a quick hiking vacation, a mini vacation, Terry Pluto, award-winning columnist from The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com. Terry, you went uh, took a couple days earlier this week and got into the great outdoors. How was it? Yeah, we went down um, in the Marietta area. It was crazy in terms of, I mean, yesterday when we went hiking in the afternoon, it was 58 and sunny. And, you know, up here, 130 miles away, 150 miles away. It's like they were acting like it was going to be Armageddon, but clearly it wasn't very nice. And so it was just not, I, I think, you know, we are, uh, we're blessed in Ohio because you could drive a couple hours and really get in a totally different uh, kind of vibe. Like if you go down along the river, you have kind of the, the Southern vibe a little bit as somebody who lived in Savannah and Greensboro, I could say that, or if you go, you know, up on the lake. I, I, I really love our state for that. It's underrated. So there, Mike DeWine and I are both saying, what, what did DeWine say? Hawaii, come to Ohio? So there we are. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're here. So I know you've been trying to get me to go down to Marietta for a long time, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to try and do that this summer. So I, I know uh, a lot of our listeners probably have had some good times in Marietta. So I hope to get down there this next couple of months. So, all right, Terry, you're right back into working, um, writing. Uh-huh. And also you have an appearance tonight at the music box down in the flats. I know it's last minute. We're taping late on in the week on Thursday, but why don't you tell people real quick in case people can make it down there tonight? Yeah, it'll be Thursday night. The doors open at five and I speak at seven. Um, you know, they serve food and drinks and that kind of thing. It's a nice place. I've, I've been there before. And, um, I started at seven. In fact, the guy wrote me, I'm coming. What time are you going to be done? So I said, start at seven. And I know they, they limit it to an hour. And then I'll be around before to talk to some people and afterwards too. And if they, right, want book, go to... they want to bring some books to get signed, that that works also. That'll be a good night. Okay. Uh, you, go, you can go to musicboxclee.com to find out more on that. And again, it's tonight, which is Thursday, the 26th of January. So, all right, Terry, back to it. And the Cavaliers... You go away for a few days, and the Cavs are still pondering making some moves. And you have a column running tomorrow on Cleveland.com and in the Plain Dealer. And the headline kind of asks the question, how should the Cavs play Let's Make a Deal? And you kind of lay out some of the background of just how much they've done in a very short amount of time. Why don't you talk about the Cavs and Let's Make a Deal? Well, I decided to look at um, the moves they made really beginning with the Jared Allen trade. And that was in January of 21. So that's only two years ago. Because in my mind, I guess you could say drafting Gary, Darius Garland was, was the first thing. But where they were able to kind of develop their identity, they traded for Jared Allen, they drafted Mobley, and then you know they went and acquired Mitchell. But when you make trades, you trade draft picks. So I started saying, well, how many of these draft picks – have they traded of late? And the answer is, since you already read it. Well, when you asked me the question originally, you, you were asking how many first-round first picks round. have the Cavs traded since January 13th, 2021? And my first answer was five. But you actually found another one yeah, <laughs> to make it it's six. Re- so. It's really <laughs> six. And we'll break it down. So there was a pick they had from Milwaukee. That went in the Jared Allen deal. Then – they made the trade for Karis Levert. That was their own pick. So that was number two. Then came the Donovan Mitchell deal, which has always been Donovan Mitchell and three players and three number ones. But in effect, it's really four because Abaje, who was their first round pick in 2022, never played 
for the Cavs. He did play in the summer league, but he never really played. He was traded along with three fu- three future number ones. So basically, they have traded, you know, six picks. If you break it down, the the uh, trade for uh, Mitchell going from farther out, 29, 27, 25, and they traded 22. And a problem there is going to be their 23rd, their pick this year is going to be going in a Karis LeVert deal. So when you talk about making trades, you have the Ted Stepien rule in there. They can't trade a number one, at least the way it's set up now, until like the next decade. They're all gone. Yeah, you have to you you and you you've written about this and it's the Stepien rule. You cannot go two years without having a first round pick. So that's yes. why the Cavs have to hold on to their picks in those even numbered years so that they're part of the draft. Uh, I think you can trade it really late. Like maybe there's there's some date where you could trade it, but it's really really late. Like yeah, very close it, to the there's draft. There's always like everything else with the salary cap and that. There's minutia in there, but in general, um, you can't do that unless you pick up a pick from somewhere else. Why is this important? Because like if you want one of the Bogdanoviches that floating around out there, the Pistons are looking for a first round pick. Teams are always looking for first round picks. Um, and also now teams are more willing to trade first round picks when you really look at that. Because like they said, there were four number of first round picks in the Rudy Rudy Gobert deal from Minnesota to Utah, but actually there's five because they took the first round pick of the Timberwolves too, just like they did from the Cavs. So that's where you're at. So then you go, all right, what kind of trade do you want to make? And one of my arguments is if they've made so many big moves of late, you have five starters, all 26 or younger that, um, sure. Could you trade Levert for Malik Beasley or something like that? Yeah. Would somebody want Kevin Love's expiring contract? Possibly. But those are not the type of things that are going to, I think, take this team that has been struggling on the road and that and just kick them up to another higher level. More of that, fans hate to hear this, but because this often sounds like things that the Guardians say, more of that improvement has to come internally with the guy, young guys you have playing together. I'm going to repeat again. All the starters are 26 or younger. I was talking, had just a background conversation quite a while ago with Kobe Altman, and he mentioned something to me. He said, think about Evan Mobley. He goes, this is the environment I wanted for him to come in. Ever since he's arrived here, he's played in meaningful games. Because he said, we saw how hard it was when you bring young guys into a situation where they've been losing and there's kind of hanging over the whole franchise, it's this uh, get ping pong balls. We don't really care what happens. Play the kids, take a beating. Well, you could play the kids, take a beating year after year after year forever. And that is why um, Altman was very aggressive, you know, starting with the trade for Allen and then also signing Allen to the five-year $100 million contract, taking it. He, he gambled on Darius Garland. It was a big gamble. I had a lot of my NBA friends say, I don't know if that guy's worthy of number five pick. And it turned out to be correct. And then, you know, he took his, his, his big swing with uh, the Mitchell deal. So, Terry, this is just a – it's a remarkable time for this franchise right now because all right, they're, they're 29 and 20. They're as of today, they're number the number five seed in the East. I think they're six games behind Boston for first place in the East. And if the playoffs started today, they'd be playing Brooklyn, which is Mm. which is in fourth place right now. And that talk about a matchup that would fans would want to see. Boy, they 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 better put that one on national. I know all the playoff games are on national TV. I'm I'm always cracking jokes here at home about how the Cavs are never the Lakers are on every night and the Cavs are never on national TV. But anyway, um, so you have been advocating for give this group some time. Mm -hmm. But there's some things going on here that you talk about developing from within. This team lost in the clutch at New York the other night. Yes, it did. The outside shooting is really struggling. Kevin Love Mm -hmm. is having a hard time coming back from that uh, injury to his wrist. 
And there's some issues here. You've got guys coming off the injured list, um, Dean Wade and Ricky Rubio, and there's playing time at stake. And there's a, it's a very unsettling feeling right now if you're a Cavs fan. How would you, if you're a, if you're Kobe Altman or JB Bickerstaff, put your coach and GM hat on? Give it your. You want to give this group time, but what would you be doing to kind of a, a pull the strings, make things happen to get this thing where it needs to be down the I line. Would be, I would be looking to move Levert. Um, I think that he he knows he's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. He's been in a I – I wrote a long thing about this last Sunday. He, he's put in a role where he's not comfortable, um, playing small forward. Yes, he plays some shooting guard when and starts when Mitchell's out, but it just hasn't – I don't think it's worked. Well, and you wrote this, Terry. It, it was a fit – when the trade happened, but it doesn't yeah. work now because of the Mitchell trade. Exactly. I mean, right. Because they didn't know they were going to get Donovan Mitchell. They were just looking for somebody to score. Levert was available. If they could find more of a pure shooter that would kind of fit cap wise, uh, I would do that. To me, that's a kind of a secondary move. You're always making those, but the kind of move, I think some fans say, well, they got to go and do something to get past Brooklyn or the Celtics this year. What are you gonna trade Garland or something? I don't know. I'm not doing that. I don't even know if you could trade Garland because you just signed the extension. I forgot when it is that um, you have to wait. But the point is, break into that that core group of the core four. Uh, those are the guys that need to play together. And sometimes you just have to take a pounding for a while and and see how it goes. And also. This is where JB is going to, as I say, earn your money, try to figure out who plays and who isn't. Uh, love hurting that thumb and not shooting well at all now going on two months. That has been a big loss to these guys because he would come off the bench and score a lot. I'll say this. He's working hard on defense. He's getting rebounds. I mean, the other night, I think he took one shot in 12 minutes in New York. I mean, what was that? Yeah, and he went the longest time without having any shots that game. Yeah. Um, and thanks for correcting me. I think I said it was a wrist injury. It is a thumb, right? Yeah. That, that he's been dealing with. So, uh, so Terry, the um, Chris Fedor, our colleague who covers the team after the loss to the Knicks the other night, did kind of an in-depth piece looking at different areas of the team. One of the things he got into, and I wanted to see, maybe we could, maybe we can get our pens and paper out here and make a list. But Chris asked J.B. Bickerstaff. Hey, is with these guys coming back, you've got a lot more options. Is it time to extend your rotation to 11 or 12 guys? And I wanted to read this quote from JB because I thought it was interesting. He says, no, the consistency piece is where people perform their best. And when you get to, in my mind, 11 or 12 guys, it doesn't give guys an opportunity to truly get comfortable and get consistent burn. So that's why we talked about some guys may not just play for a couple of games until we find the right rhythm and then give them another chance with, an, with another group and see if we can find a better a better rhythm. We just want to give you guys an opportunity to be consistent. Um, what do you think of that approach? And I guess what we could do is maybe run through the roster a little bit here and see who do you think might be the guys who are the odd men out, sitting out a couple of games, seeing their minutes go down. Um, where do you see that heading? Well, first thing is, this is something Earl Weaver would drill into us when we when I covered him in 79 for the Baltimore Sun. He would say, you would bring out something, he goes, somebody always gets hurt. They may not be hurt now, but somebody always gets hurt. So right now, while we talk about this, we'll be talking about it with the assumption that Donovan Mitchell is healthy. But as we know, he may be out. So somebody always gets hurt. So that's one way some of these things are alleviated. Nonetheless, playing, I think, even 10 is difficult. Uh, unless you were to do, I've seen it work a little bit. Hubie Brown did it, a couple other things. They actually had a second five, and they would bring them all in at once. And what he would do is he would bring them in. It was a at young athletic pressing unit just to come in for five to eight minutes and try to turn the game upside down with pressure defense, that kind of stuff. It also was a team that was not expected to contend for a title. But other, I, I, think, it's, I think it's hard because JB is right. You do need flow. And also, if you want to play good defense, if you keep changing your personnel on the floor, it's going to hurt you defensively. 
you, communication, you, other issues, right? Things, exactly. Guys not being yes. worse that each other think they're going to be, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I would say that, uh, all right, so you have that. You, I guess you, you – all right, so we, we'll go with the regular starting five with the Coro being the small forward and the big four. You know, you, you got to stick with love. Hope the thumb gets better. If nothing else, he gives you defensive rebounding. And he and he's still among the league leader in drawing charges. And you do have to play Rubio, who, by the way, I thought was terrible in New York. A couple of games, his ball handling is fine, but he you could tell the game's fast for him right now, and he's having trouble scoring. Uh, you've got to hope that he comes around. So those are your two guys, because a year ago when they came off the bench, those two, it was dynamite. And then you go into – uh, Lamar Stevens, who I like because of the defensive element. Chetty Osmond drives me crazy. I have to admit, he, he just, I don't know what the heck goes on with him. And yet, a couple of weeks ago, I remember we looked it up as our trivia question who had the best plus minus on the team? It was Chetty Osmond. It was an unbelievable. Um, so, really, if you look at players, quality players, you have Love, Rubio, and Levert. That, so, that takes you to eight. Uh, a choice between playing Osman and Dwayne Wade, I would probably play Wade. So that's nine. And suddenly my guy Stevens is out and uh, Neto is out. That was the other name I wrote down. Uh, but it, it's a little difficult. But in general, probably there'll be somebody be resting or whatever to, to allow that to get in. But they have to find somebody off the bench that can score. And that's why I have a feeling Osman will probably get more time because when he's hot, he does get the ball in the basket. I mean, I think it was – Chris had this in his story, and then I used it. I believe they're like, like what, 25th in bench scoring in the NBA, something like that, out of 30 teams? Yep, I believe that's right. And that's really discouraging. When, you, when you're talking about a bench of Levert, Love, and Rubio – now, granted, Rubio's just come back, but – those three guys have started extensively in their career. And so it isn't as if Kobe and Altman simply didn't bring in some veterans. They're sitting there. They just got to produce more. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you talked about Jetty and Chris had this in his story. I mean, I think since January 12th, when Rubio came back, uh, Jetty Osmond's averaging 12 minutes a game. Yeah. And, uh, I, and, you Chris wrote that he, he, he might see him being the odd man out. And I, 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 you're right. There's only so many minutes in a game, Terry. And if well, Donovan Mitchell's be... playing, he's eaten up between 30 and 40 of those. So, mm, yeah. And he's so, and I think JB is going to be sitting there going Osman or Wade, you know, Wade, by the way, has all these great plus minus numbers and everything else with different combinations, you know, all that analytic stuff they have. Because he's kind of like a very poor man's marketing. He could he's he's big and he could cover the small forward position. He can make some threes, uh, but he's just not trouble staying staying healthy. Um, I think it's going to be it's a it's a it's a um, it's a challenge for JB because I just keep looking at those names and if you go like Terry Francona will look at this and he would say Levert's got a track record, Rubio's got a track record. Love has got a track record. I'm going to go with them quite a long time because he generally feels if you have a track record, unless you've had a, a debilitating injury or you know you finally have gotten really old, you'll probably get back to it. But it's hard to wait for that to happen. So those would be the three that I would play. And then you could fill in whether you want to go Osman or Wade in the game. Um, I still like I still like Stevens' defensive element that he brings to it. I, I'm glad O'Coral's playing better. Yeah, there's and like you said, Terry, if if there's an injury, somebody turns an ankle or something, then the whole equation changes. So uh, mm-hmm. they, and they it usually take, does game at a time, which is or you could just day. be like Golden State and say well, we're not we're not playing four starters. I like yeah, that. Just rest everybody. <laughs> and, and you know, in the NBA is no problem with that. I mean, Adam Silver just says, oh well, you know, we don't like that. What do you didn't do about it? There's got to be something they can do, Terry. I mean, it, it, 
the, so the Warriors last week played Boston the night before they come to Cleveland. It goes in overtime, and the next night they come here and don't play any of their starters. And there's a lot of people in town who bought tickets to that game, bringing their kids to see the Warriors, that this great Warriors dynasty mm-hmm. comes to town once a year. And of all the games you're going to have load management, like that's the one where you're going to be making an appearance one time. It's just they got to do something. They do. I, I mean, mean, you, you can say, any okay, court. Curry's not playing because whatever, but Clay Thompson's playing. But you don't bench four starters. I think Poole was the only starter who played. And, of course, then the Cavs went out and acted like they were just not even be engaged. Um, that See, that's the stuff, too, that uh, JB's still fighting through with this group. That What, do you, what are you doing? Yeah, and you know, speaking of um, Steve Kerr, I did want to ask you real quick, Terry, before we take a break. I, I thought he brought up an interesting point last week. He thinks that the season should be 72 games instead of 82, and he doesn't know that it would ever happen. He says the last 10 games of the year, most teams are just kind of in la la land. They don't really, they don't really care. They're just playing the string out. What do you, what do you think of a 72 game regular season? Do you like it? A and B, would you ever see it happening? I think one of the reasons they went to the play-in tournament was to take that away from Steve. That, that argument where a lot of those teams are still competing for that seven, eight, nine, ten 10 spot. And also you have some teams that want to make sure they're in the top six. You know, that was what the Cavaliers wanted a year ago and weren't able to nail down at the end. Then they got at the play and bang, they're done. So I, but you could still it, have that pennant race. Effect you could, if you did it in 72 games, but the, the argument that they're in La La land, for me, doesn't I don't buy it. Oh, I see. The argument, okay. that's what I'm saying, because the argument that the season's too long, of course it is, and by the way, the NBA is not going to change it because of those, those games. I just think that if you see a team and they go in and they're blatantly saying they're just resting four starters, I would come up with some you – know, Maybe that cost you a second round pick or something. I'm, I mean, really, where you want to? Because if you really say, okay, they cost you ten thousand dollars, the teams don't care. They don't. It's it's an approach the NFL has taken in terms of some of the things they're trying to make change in the league, hiring and other things. If you if you do well at something, they give you extra draft picks, and if you don't, they take them away. If you do something mm-hmm. wrong, yeah, something yeah. of that sort. Um, I like that. That that would be it. You'd have to you – know, and basically, you kind of have your serial offenders. Yeah, it might be like, you you know, keeping track of technical fouls during the season, but you'd keep track of how many healthy starters you scratched during the course of a season. Because it's not hard to find out no matter what they say. I remember Wayne Embry told me, but see, that was when they didn't have a 15-man roster. They only had 12. And so when he would want to put a guy on the – injured list to bring in someone else he just always said we use knee tendonitis every guy in the nba is tendonitis of the knee and i can give you an x-ray to prove it never goes I, away <laughs> and maybe just i just need to get him down for 10 days or whatever the minimum was back then um so i guess you there's always going to be people moving around it but at least make some sort of an effort when you go into cleveland and you sit four of them because you had an overtime game the night before in boston that should not go unpunished. Well, and the reason they did it was because they were playing Boston. It was on national TV, and the the league probably wanted that game the sure. way it was. So. And they probably wanted to go at Boston, too, to see where they're at. You know, Golden State's been up and down this year. By the yeah. way, how about – I was just looking at this. Mike Brown with Sacramento. I'll just tell you, the Sacramento Kings, the last time I looked, are leading the NBA in scoring. I thought you and I would grow hair again before Mike Brown would ever coach an NBA team leading the league in scoring. And I like Mike Brown, but Mike Brown is more of a defensive guy that, and he has gone there and there's, they're playing some defense. They're not awful, but they are running gun, moving it up and down the floor and averaging about 120. Well, I, I, I've thought this for a long time, Terry, you know, fans put, people in boxes players yes. and coaches and when there's a lot of times when a coach has a first go around at something or and it's like oh well they're only good at x and mike brown was like known as the defensive coach who couldn't figure out how to get the Cavs score with mm-hmm. lebron and coaches change just like we all do and i think you're seeing kind of the evolution of mike brown moving into the modern nba and 
what, they're 27 and 20 or something right now? Going yeah, and the best action? thing that happened to Mike, well, a couple of things happened to Mike Brown. I know him fairly well. Number one was early in his career, he was made into a defensive specialist by first Greg Popovich and then later, I believe, was Carlisle in Indiana. He, in effect, was like their defensive coordinator. That was what he did. Then he got the first Cavs job. Then remember, he was with the Lakers for five minutes. And then he came back to the Cavs, and he was still sort of that defensive guy. Then he goes to Golden State, and he sits next to Steve Kerr for years and years. And if you remember, when Kerr was ill a couple of years ago, Brown coached that team for over half of the regular season and part of the playoffs. And the last thing he told me, I'm going to do is mess with anything Steve Kerr was. So he immersed himself in that motion offense and all those things that Kerr runs. And he's just taking it over to uh, Sacramento. And so now he is the guru of that. Yeah, I mean, talk about, boy, two coaches to sit on their bench, Greg Popovich and, yeah. and Steve, Steve Kerr. Kerr yeah. Talk about getting a P, you know. Jim and Schwartz Carlisle was, was very PhD good, too. Football. That's know. a Ph.D. in basketball. <laughs> yeah. I remember when uh, the Cavs hired uh, Brown, I went down to uh, San Antonio and – I was running some stuff, and Popovich told me, and I can't remember the name. of I think it was Stephen Jackson was the player. He said Stephen Jackson should give half of his paycheck to Mike Brown. This is what Popovich told me. He said because he got Stephen straightened out, matured to play defense, got him to play our style of ball, um, kind of a name lost in NBA. But that always stuck with me. And now he's doing some, some really good things in Sacramento. Yeah. They're actually leading the Pacific Division. So, like I said, it's 120 points a game. Yep. All right, so Terry, the Cavs tonight, they're playing at Houston, and then Friday night they're at Oklahoma City at 8 o'clock to wrap up the road trip, and then they're home for a three-game homestand. Sunday, the Clippers at 7, Tuesday, the Heat at 7, and then next Thursday, Groundhog Day, February 2nd, against Memphis at 7.30. So, all right, let's take a break, Terry. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Browns. I want to ask you if you think Miles Garrett should have been a finalist for NFL Defensive Player of the Year, which he was not. So get some, get your notes ready on that one. We're we'll, uh, also going to talk a little bit about Cade York and Phil Dawson. Some interesting numbers there. Uh, Terry's going to talk about what he saw at Guards Fest over the weekend, where all the Guardians coaches, players, and fans got together for a weekend of baseball talk. We've got uh, Terry's faith column that we'll talk about, and we got a couple of good Hey Terry questions. We'll be right back on Terry's Talking. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is officially live. Now you can legally bet on all your favorite sports anytime and anywhere right here in Ohio with DraftKings. For a limited time, new customers who sign up with promo code TALKIN, that's T-A-L-K-I-N, and bet $5 or more will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. DraftKings has the best features including same-game parlays, player props, and more with fast and easy payouts right at your fingertips. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers can use promo code TALKIN to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code TALKIN. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, 21 and over, physically present in Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dkng.co slash oh for terms. Whole Foods Market has you covered all winter long with next level finds for any occasion. Score big for game day with your favorite selection of hard to find beer, party platters, and winning appetizers. From their prepared foods to wallet happy goodies. From 365 by Whole Foods Market, it's all good. And for those nights when you just want to cozy up and have a romantic dinner at home, there's no place better to shop. From roses to animal welfare certified meat. Level up all your winter plans at Whole Foods Market. We're back on Terry's Talking, David Campbell and Terry Pluto. Terry, it's uh, always Brown season, as you know. And this week, um, some of the awards are starting to roll out, some of the finalists, which will all be unveiled, uh, the winners, on February 9th at the NFL Honors, the week of the Super Bowl. So this week, the NFL announced uh, the it's the AP NFL Defensive Player of the Year finalists, and the three finalists are Nick Bosa of the 49ers, Chris Jones of the Chiefs, and Micah Parsons of the Cowboys. That's a pretty good list of three there. Miles Garrett did not make it. Mary Kay Cabot, our colleague who covers the Browns, wrote 
a piece this week. She made an argument for why she thought Miles Garrett should have been a finalist and that he had a case for it. Um, do you want me to run through some of those numbers right now? I can probably do that. Who did she kick out? Well, I, I'm trying to remember who she kicked out, but she basically was making the point that Garrett was the number one edge rusher in the NFL, according to Pro Football Focus, with a 92.5 yes. grade. Parsons was number two, Bosa was number three, and Jones was tied for first among interior defensive linemen at 92. And she oh, also, I... as part of her argument, was saying that he was the number one edge rusher. Um, he also double was team. most double and triple teamed uh, mm-hmm. of any defensive player in the league this year. And that, and the other thing she pointed out was that he didn't have a lot of other people on that defense that offenses had to worry about blocking. Uh, Jadavian Clowney, hardly any sacks this year. Anybody else on that defensive line didn't really have a, a, a year worth mentioning in terms of sacks. I think two, might two or three might have been the other high if I remember correctly. But um, where do you stand on this? Do you think Miles Garrett fits into that group of three? Would you have knocked somebody out, or do you think that he, you know, was at number four, or where would you have him? That's a tough one for me. It's like to me, Micah Parsons has, has just been amazing when I've seen him play, but I don't watch. Cowboys every game. Uh, you were telling me that you really like Jones quite a bit. Why is that? Well, I think all three of these guys are just incredible. And the thing that separates them, and even Chris Jones playing an interior spot, you watch a game and these guys take over the game almost every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Micah Parsons, like you said, he's all over. Nick Bosa, great against the run, great against the pass, all over the field. Chris Jones, making plays even when he's getting double teamed inside. And I thought I thought the car accident and the injuries that Miles Garrett suffered this year really hurt him in terms of that week-to-week dominance. And we, we, we all saw some just amazing games from him this year, but we also saw some where he was getting double and triple teamed and you didn't hear his name a whole lot. Um, so I think, I think that hurt him, and, and he probably would admit that, that the shoulder and everything else he had going on kind of didn't let him have that high elite level of consistency. But um, that's just me. What do you think? Well, one thing I think is a little side issue to this. Jim Schwartz is smiling right now because he's going to sit down and say, see, Miles, I mean, you were good. But if you want to be in this conversation, I know how to get you there. And here's how we're going to do it. And, of course, he has this whole list of, great defensive lineman that he has coached over the years so from that that point of view because he wasn't going to win the award uh, the browns weren't good enough and as you mentioned he he missed the game i believe after the car accident there are a couple others where he didn't look as good um it, this could be a good thing for the browns i'm very serious him not making it no no i believe it it sets up schwartz to come in and say whether you think it's fair or not uh, let's look at this, and here's our scheme and how we're going to set you up to be even better. Because if the Browns are going to become this team that makes the playoffs and win a playoff game, uh, Garrett's got to be in that conversation at the top three, I believe. And they have to have a coordinator that knows how to get him there. And, of course, the personnel department that's going to uh, shape up the defensive line while Schwartz has been very careful to say, you know, Kevin Stefanski's hiring the coaches and I work for the Browns. I mean, he's been around the block more than enough times to know I'm not going to act like I have any say on things. He's going to have, I think, a fair amount of influence on the type of players they add to the defensive line, you know, what he wants done. It's a good spot for him to come in because he comes in with a lot, a good reputation. He comes in probably with a very hefty contract um, because the other teams were interested in him and a defense that he can run. Because Kevin Stefanski is going to probably do business as he's always done business. So concerning the offense. So this part is kind of a neat thing for him. But in the end, I go, I have a hard time knocking on any of those three guys for, for miles. I do too. I do too. And, uh, you know, and Mary Kay as part of her story interviewed, uh, Cherry and Williams of pro football talk who's an AP voter. And Cherry made the point that like when the Browns get good, miles Garrett will start winning these awards. Yeah. 
a lot of it is team success too, and being seen uh, on high profile games on the, on the primetime games and everything. So that, that was a really good point I thought, but uh, um, all right, Terry, I know about your passion for place kicking and we've kind of been <laughs> dabbling in this a little bit, but uh, Irie Harris, one of our colleagues who covers the Browns and does a lot of analytics stuff, went through the numbers and we finally have the Cade York versus Phil Dawson rookie year comparison. <laughs> Yeah. So I thought it might be fun to spend a couple of minutes on that since we talk about kicking quite a bit on this podcast. So um, as you know, Phil Dawson was playing in a 16 game season when he came into the league. Uh, and actually, he played in 15 games his rookie year. He was eight of 12 on field goals as a rookie, 66.7 percent, uh, two of two in, t- in the 20 yarders. He was three of five in 30 yard, you know, 30 to 39 yards and three of five from 40 to 49. He also made 23 out of 24 extra points. So again, Phil Dawson went eight of 12 as a rookie. Cade York as a rookie went 24 of 32 on field goals, 75% compared to Phil Dawson's 66.7. Cade York was five of five in in the twenties. He was nine of 12 in the thirties and six of eight in the forties and four of seven in the fifties. He also made 35 of his 37 extra points, which are longer, as we all know. So kind of comparable, right? And people point to Phil Dawson as being the, you know, one of the best Browns kickers ever. It's certainly in the modern era he is. Uh, what do you think of these numbers? And, and, and do you think Cade York is going to be okay based on what you know about Phil Dawson? Well, Paul Dawson will tell you that being a rookie kicker is very hard. Being a rookie kicker on an expansion team, where <laughs> you're rarely even in field goal range, was really hard. Um, when I wrote the book Vintage Browns, uh, a couple of things came out. Number one is he believes he would not have even survived into a second year. Has I think he kicked a 37-yarder to beat the Steelers right at the end of the game, which, by the way, they almost messed up because of bad clock management. They're, I forgot why. They, they wasted a timeout. And next thing you know, it's like 17 seconds to go, and the, they're running off the field, and Dawson, these guys are running on the field. They barely got the ball snapped. It kind of fluttered between the goalposts, <laughs> and it went through. So that was a – but they beat the Steelers. And Dawson, in the back of his mind, he said, I had to get over the idea that I could get cut. Because he was cut, uh, Irie in his story mentioned how he was cut by New England and another team. But the third team that uh, that cut him, and this is a, I had to look this up to make sure I got this right. Dawson went to Old Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. It was in the spring, so he goes out to kick. He said it was baseball season. They had no goalpost up on the stadium. Bill Cowher was the coach. He took me to the outfield and told me to aim in a certain direction, and I was kicking with no uprights. He goes, I found myself feeling a little intimidated. There was <laughs> some doubt. I'll say that. Maybe I wasn't good in this, I thought. And then he went and went to Oakland, and he got cut there too. So he said, by the time I came to Cleveland, they was on the practice squad at New England for a year. And he said, then by the time he came to Cleveland, uh, he le- outlasted two kickers early, and then they brought a veteran kicker in right the last week of training camp. He had to outlast him, and he said that Chris Palmer came up to him, looked at him, and the- he goes, words I will never forget. He said, Dawson thought this going to be this great moment in my career, you know, because he cut all the time. He's going to welcome me to the club or something. He said, well, I guess we'll start with you. <laughs> inspiring words and he's and he said i realized that in the nfl for most of us once in a while there's some people who are exalted but most of us our last kick could be our last kick <laughs> you know it's so funny you Terry, when they were good. when they were looking for a host for the terry's talking podcast that's what they said to me they said i guess we'll start with you <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are yeah, but it is <laughs> and um and so that year, he was a little shaky when he kicked. The team, the whole team was wobbly. The next year, he kicked a little better. It wasn't until – and also, they weren't kicking those 50-yard field goals back then. They just weren't – they didn't put as much emphasis on kicking, uh, teaching kickers. And it wasn't until his third or fourth year he started making those long ones. And that's when he became Phil Dawson. 
or as I remember Dequell Jackson was talking about, Dawson had missed a key field goal or something, and then he won. This is when he won one time. He kicked his field goal in a blizzard in Buffalo. And I'm talking to Dequell Jackson. He goes, you don't understand. Phil Dawson's a football player. That's Phil Dawson we're talking about here. He can. I, we don't care if he misses one or two. He's not missing anymore because he's Phil Dawson. Well, he wasn't like Phil Dawson. He was that guy that tried out in Three River Stadium, kicking the outfield with no goalposts, thinking, so this is how it is in the NFL. Bill Cowher going, I don't think that's going to work out. Well, how do you even know? You know, he's the guy that was told, well, I guess we'll start with you after they ran three different kickers at him in that training camp. I, if you want to create a pressurized environment, Palmer certainly did that. And then he's a guy that, you know, didn't kick forever. He was a guy that was told here after 2012, even though he made the Pro Bowl, uh, you're too expensive. We think you're starting to slip. And then, of course, he kicked for like seven more years after that. So yeah. in that context, number one is Cade York's in a better situation because they're not ready to, to, to dump out on him. Secondly, um, I I just think you got to stick with them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think he's going to be fine too, Terry. We saw him kind of – refine his mechanics and get back to the basics a little bit when he was struggling in the middle of the season. And boy, you're right though, Terry, what a difference. Phil Dawson, 12 kicks his rookie year. Yeah. And Cade York, you know, 32. It's the just thing a that huge bothered difference. me too about York's expansion season, team. by the way, was the nine for 12 in that 30 or 39 yard range. You know, those should be pretty close to automatic. Um, now, granted, Phil, I forgot, he was three or five or something. Yeah. But it, it's a different era because we're talking 1999. That was like 23 years ago, you know. So um, we'll see how it works out. I'm just curious, too. It's, it's like the Browns, I guess if you're Mike Prefer, the special teams coach, no news is good news um, because as far as we know, they haven't really announced that he's back. They haven't also announced that he's gone. He's still here. He's probably going to survive, but I, I keep thinking, you know, if a better special teams coach suddenly became available, I wonder if they would do something. Because I know they weren't thrilled with this. Well, Mary Kay has been reporting that she's hearing that he's going to be staying more than likely. So yeah, you're right. so, yeah they, they always do that. <laughs> yeah, what do you always say, Terry? You're, yeah. you're the starting quarterback I mean, until guess, you're not, right? I guess, right. Or it might be the Chris Palmer. I guess we'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> but there no, are, there's going to be <laughs> – I guess we'll start with you, you know. There are going to be a lot of coaches talking about a lot of, a lot of jobs uh, between now and, and Super Bowl yes, weekend. And there are, and you don't right. know. You never know. And some other people still may be fired. I'm not talking about just from the Browns, but from other teams that we don't know yet. Uh, I know Schwartz is looking through the defensive staff. And I, it's hard to believe that everybody on the offensive staff is a great coach, that they couldn't improve it. Yeah, and there will be some people out there that I'm sure they'll be taking a look. So. Um, all right, Terry, let's move to the Guardians. You were able to hit Guardians Fest over the weekend, or Guards Fest, as they're calling it, um, at downtown, fans, players, coaches, mm-hmm. and you were able to talk to Terry Francona for a pretty good amount of time. Uh, why don't you talk about what you get, you learned from Guardians Fest, both from Tito and just in general, what you saw down there? Well, this is still a celebration of this, you know, improbable season that they had, and you know, the fans were, were, were delighted to see anybody. It's funny, Stephen Kwan said he kind of walked around and nobody knew who he was because <laughs> he just, you go, can that guy really be a major league player? Uh, and another guy who looks very normal, by the way, when you're to him, and I was talking to him too, was is Will Brennan. And Brennan and Kwan both use this term, which has just kind of popped up lately. And I haven't heard it. I don't know if they, it's from the, the sports psychologist, the uh, Guardians use or what. But they both use the term as you ha- I had to get over the imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome is what well, Brennan explained it to me. He said, do you realize at this point a year ago, in January of 22, he goes, I was a suspect. Because he was, if he was on any of these prospect lists, he was very low. He was going to start at double A. Not everyone in the organization was sold on him. I could tell you that. 
One guy who was is Rob Zaferlio, who was the, the farm director, because Rob told me to, to keep an eye on him. And uh, I did. And he, because in fact, if you check some of the, like I wrote a prospect story with him, uh, with Rob in spring training last year, and him and a, a guy's name is uh, Bibby, the pitcher, B-I-B-E-E. That was the other guy. He was his two sleepers. He said, these two guys got a chance to be really good, and they could come fast. And it turned out, of course, I, I'm sure he had somebody else in there that didn't work out, but those two stuck out. And so Brennan was telling me, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, so I was a suspect. He goes, and I'm in Yankee Stadium for the playoffs. You know, how did I, what am I doing here? How did that happen? You know, this is not George Valera, who's like the, you know, the, the hot prospect there, or this is, or even like a, a Bo Naylor, you know, coming up. This is, Brennan was a fifth or sixth round pick, University of Virginia, kind of, but it, it happened. And, and in a sense, here's where I'm going with this. Francona doesn't want the players now to think that they were an imposter somehow last year, that that happened, but it was a fluke. He goes, no, we have to build on that. And yeah, it's, it's, not it's, a it's one remarkable. And done. So there's the same thing happens with like actors and people who write screenplays. Oh, yeah. Like they they work and work and work their whole lives to get to this goal of being a professional athlete or whatever, and then they get there and the first thing that happens is, you know, it happens to a lot of people. They start to doubt whether they belong. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting the human psyche. And so what what Tito was saying was like, all right, we need to get over that. Like we belong, we proved it, and now we need to we need to go from here and assume we belong and compete. Right. That, and that also, was what saying. Quan talked about, too, the kind of the narrative that they play differently. You know, remember the the hustling, leading the league. In, who else decided that we're going to lead the league in infield hits? You know, they did. Somewhere along the line, they realized they're up there. Well, they, then, then you had Rosario and Quan and, and Jose competing. Who's going to get the most infield hits? But as a manager, you love this. Guys are running everything out. And then you got to, like, the Twins manager admitted when you play the Guardians, you have to be on your toes. You can't juggle the ball because they're running so hard. But it's also, Francona, different sides, it goes, I'm not going to kid you. It's a hard way to play. It's kind of like trying to win in the NBA on defense. Everybody's playing one style. You're playing another. So that's why they wanted to go get Josh Bell, bring in the guy with some power, hope Zanino can bounce back. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the things I always look at this time of year what kind of health is Francona in? Cannot underrate the value of having him the full season. The previous two seasons, he didn't go the distance. And, of course, sitting at Francona trying to explain his contract, which is actually incomprehensible. Basically, <laughs> you manage however you want. He has no agent. He sits down with Chernoff, the GM, and he sits down with Antonetti, and they just cook up a deal. And that's what it is. So then he says it's a one year. They say, no, it's not a one year. Then he goes, well, I'm going year to year. It's like, whatever. I'm sure they're paying him very well. Nobody's getting missed over. And I think he does have a, a friend who's an attorney that looks it over. But a lot of these um, managers, they all have, uh, there's a couple agents that represent these guys and they're all trying to make more money than the other guy. I mean, Francona is such a purist. I mean, it's just why he wants to play like in Cleveland. It, he, he keeps he, it's a pure baseball thing. Yeah, it's classic and he's known these guys at the Guardians for so long. It's just, they're just they're like friends, they're like best friends at this point. It's yeah. like I mean a tough it's thing less will business be business and more just like all right, let's get this done so we can get to the business of baseball. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. he was eating a ham sandwich on his computer when they finally negotiated the deal and Chernoff said he had to tell him to put in he's like I don't want to get in there, put in a this clause is better for you, Tito. Let's put this in. And like when they did the original contract with Shapiro um, and, and Antonetti, Antonetti wanted to put in a bonus thing for manager of the year. And Francona said, no, let's not do that. He's won one of three times, by the way. So he just said, that's not how I view it. If it is, it should, we should be organization of the year. And, he, you know, he means this stuff. See, that's one thing if you say that and then behind closed doors, you're just fighting them for every dollar and every clause in the contract and every I mean the guy rides a scooter I mean look at him this is what he is it's why it works 
Yeah, it's classic. And uh, yeah, and he had his scooter scooter stolen over the over the weekend here the last few days, and the the Cleveland police finally found it. So they, he's back. They solved that crime, yeah. which is good. And, and everybody went immediately to Kevin Cash to see if he had any part in the, <laughs> yeah, anything to do with it. They yeah. always play pranks on each other. So. I mean, the the Guardians are nice to be around. I mean, and then you go back now. Okay, here you are, ten years in. He's going into his eleventh year. Nobody's managed the team longer in Cleveland history. Nobody's won more games. Um, nobody's been manager here more often. You know, six six playoffs, one World Series, one losing season. His losing season was eighty and eighty two. Uh, it's a remarkable run with generally a bottom five payroll. Yeah, and um, he'll be riding a scooter into Cooperstown someday. So, down oh the yeah. Road, so, all right, Terry, we're running a little short on time here. Let's get to your um your faith columns of the last couple of weeks have dealt with uh, Mudcat Grant, the former Cleveland pitcher, and you got some great response that you ran in your faith and you column on Sunday from fans who interacted with Mudcat Grant and just had some remarkable stories to tell about this guy that, that just seemed like he always had time for everybody. Well, the, of course, the extraordinary part of that story is Grant pitched from the late 50s through the middle 70s, 15 years in the big leagues. And um, he was on TV here for quite a while afterwards, but it's, he's been gone from the baseball scene 40 years probably. And people remember him, and of course, it seems like when he was working for the team, both as a player and then in the front office, he must have went to every first communion breakfast, every like you know outing for appearances, because they just kept getting letters from, oh yeah, Mudcat Grant, he signed this or that. I mean, one of the most remarkable ones is a lady named Barb Matthews who wrote and said that uh, she wrote him a letter and she had had inoperable what they thought was an operable brain cancer was she's thinking to be around young when she long and he kind of said well bring your parents down let them know you know you're here and i think he sent her some tickets they came to the game he stuck with her for years and years he would visit her in the hospital different with uh different treatment she had she talked about playing catch with him to, well we got to work on your hand eye coordination you know this stuff like that guys wrote me about they were in the – when they were – this is during the time of the draft and that, and they would do reserve duty and for a couple of weeks. And they were in the, basically in the Army with Grant for a couple of years in the off season for a few weeks and playing poker with him and playing catch with Mudcat Grant in the service. And it, it just – but the point of the faith column was like whenever – like when I met Mudcat Grant, I was a kid. I was like six or seven years old. First autograph I remember getting, I went up to him. And my dad said, that's my cat Grant. Go get his autograph. He was walking through the concourse at the old stadium. It was the last day of the season. He's got, he's holding a suitcase in one hand, a garment bag in another. And so I went up and I got the, there and I'm a little shaky and what you want, little man? And I said, well, Mr. Mr. Grant, Mr. Can, can I have your autograph? Go, what's your name? So I told him Terry and he wrote, you know, Terry, best wishes, my cat Grant. And, it reminded me, and that's what everybody else said, that Grant would always ask, what's your name? And I said, the power of learning a person's name and not saying what's your name like on their boss, I think is, is something, too. You know, you see him as a person. So uh, I get a bunch more. I could just keep running these things on my cat Grant, who seems like he's barely a speck in the rearview mirror of life because uh, it was so long ago. And it's either – they had it, or somebody else in their family had told them about Cat Grant's story. So, you know, my cat died in 2021. By the way, interesting career. You know, he was the first African American in the American League to win 20 games. How about this? He threw 89 complete games in his career. He saved 55 games because the end of his career he turned into a closer, and when that role was still evolving. You know, is he a Hall of Famer? No, in terms of stats, is he a Hall of Famer? When you talk about how people act, and I'm not trying to put them on a church window or whatever, but just pure decency. And you know what I also found over the years? Sometimes you write something like that, and then here comes an email or two. Yeah, I ran into the guy, and he was drunk. Or, you know, no, none of that stuff came in. Well, well said, Terry, about just the impact he had. And, and I, the emails don't and lie. The role model. They, they don't yeah, lie. yeah, they don't. No, there's mm-hmm. too many. All right, we got a couple of Hey Terry questions. We, we got to wrap up soon here. We're running a little late, but we're doing okay. So you ready? Mm-hmm. All right, this one is from longtime friend of the podcast, Jack and Erie. And Jack says, hey, guys, hope you had a great holiday season. Hoinsey mentioned on the podcast 
the Guardians podcast recently with Joe Noga that Neil Huntington was heavily involved in the renovation design of Progressive Field as far as player facilities are concerned. I had no idea he was back with the organization. What exactly is his role? Anyone who got the Pirates into the playoffs obviously is nice to have in your back pocket. <laughs> So, yeah, he, um, so Neil Huntington was the former GM of the Pirates, and he's back with the Guardians. Um, we have a pretty good idea what he's doing right now, right, Terry? Yeah, he well, he was special advisor, I think, is his title. Um, what the Guardians like to do is they'll bring they'll bring people in that they just happen to like. That's how that's how the relationship started with Terry Francona and the Guardians. After Francona was fired by the Phillies, people only remember he managed there. Um, he had a relationship somewhere with Mark Shapiro. Shapiro brought him in for a year as an advisor. Then Francona went back into baseball uh, from there as a coach. And uh, But uh, Huntington kind of grew up in their farm system along with Antonetti. I'm talking about the farm system for executives. And all under – basically, you kind of draw the line from John Hart to Mark Shapiro – actually, Hank Peters to John Hart to Mark Shapiro to Antonetti and Huntington and Chernoff. And then Huntington was hired to go run the Pirates, and he did get them in the playoffs a year, and they've had a rough time, you know, since he eventually was fired. So he sat out a year and then came back here. But, yes, he's involved in kind of the renovations, but he is one of the people that they talked to at length about Josh Bell because he was with the Pirates when Bell was drafted and, and came to the big leagues. So that was a – Thing. And they use him, I think, just as a source for looking at uh, different players. I mean, Danny Ferry right now has a job uh, like that, as does Chris Grant. Both of them are these special advisors or assistants, assistant something or others, with the Sandy, uh, San Antonio Spurs. You know, get these guys who've been GMs, and also sometimes you you just you just brainstorm with them, uh, and and they have a relationship. You could say, oh, these guys taking care of each other. Okay, fine, but it's also a guys with with track records, so that's the deal on Huntington. Yeah, and, and he also had a big role in the Goodyear set, uh, facility when it was being developed. So mm-hmm. I mean, you know, some people might not realize Terry that the renovations at Progressive Field are a lot of them are for the fans and for the seats and for the box cars in the upper deck, but there's also a whole other renovation going on underneath the stands for the player facility, the batting cages and all that other stuff that the players the video deal rooms. Okay. They're really trying to get more and more of that video stuff in there. They have it, but get it to it. Yeah. So someone like Neil Huntington a, who's been around you know, knows, right. uh, knows the facility renovations, uh, knows what players need. It, mm-hmm. It's good to have someone like that. Involved. And I think it helped too, that he had had a background um, immersed in the national league up till a few years ago. So that helped them. Cool. All right. Last one, Terry, this one is from Daryl Ray Schlebach. And Daryl said, Daryl Ray says, will the Browns make it to the Super Bowl with the new defensive coordinator, Jim Schwartz? What do you think, Terry? Big question for January. <laughs> yeah. The season has started, but what do you think? Can um, he make that bunch of a difference? Well, let's put it this way. I feel better about that than if you come back um, with the previous coordinator and some of those coaches. So that's number one. Number two is. Um, I think it helps also to have uh, a, another head coach on the staff, not just to replace uh, Stefanski, but simply as somebody uh, who can, if Stefanski's open, can offer some advice. Remember, they also have Bill Callahan there. He was, he's was he been a head coach in the NFL. Um, but no, I mean, the big thing, if you're talking Super Bowl, you really want to go, can Kevin Stefanski make – and beautiful music where they become an elite player with Deshaun Watson. That's the key part. Because then Schwartz has to have a top 10 defense also. But if the quarterback is an elite, and in my mind, I, I've i always said that I think Deshaun's a good quarterback. I have not never called him elite. And until I see elite, I'm not going to call him elite. I think he's good. Now this year was a mess, so we will, you know, we'll see from there. And I also know that you know, when the Browns look around, I see Joe Burrow taking the Bengals that far. Um, and you look at the good thing is where's Baltimore, Lamar Jackson? You're not sure. And then um, you know Kenny Pickett, 
I'll give them that. They played well, but I mean, is that guy really going to be big time? So it, it's open for them to at least come in behind Burrow with the second best quarterback in the division. Well, I should remember back to 2020, Terry, um, Kevin Stefanski, he, he'll never talk about like <laughs> goals or we're going to do this or we're going to do that. But as soon as they got into the playoffs, he's, he told the players and told the media, we're going for the Super Bowl. Like, yeah. When, when she, and so this team was seven and 10. With given the way the Jets game the way they did and all the things that happened and having their you know the suspension of Watson and I, I think with with Jim Schwartz they can get into the playoffs and then we'll see yes we'll see what happens now there I wish you'd ask that if that were the yeah. question the answer is absolutely yes because that's an upgrade for them yep and I would also believe just he will have more uh, cachet and influence in shaping the roster There's on no the doubt defensive about that. side. From the, the inside side. out, from the inside yep. out too. So we're going to see some some things happen here. It's going to be combine pretty soon, and then we're heading right into the draft. So a lot of things are going to be happening very quickly here for the Browns and all of the other teams in Cleveland. So, all right, Terry, I think we're good. You good? Yes, I am. All right. Uh, welcome back. To, uh, once again, if you want to check out Terry at the Music Box tonight, uh, that's tonight at 7 o'clock, right, Terry, on the 26th? Yeah, the doors the open at 5. They serve food and all that, and I speak at 7. Head over to that. If you want to sign up, we'd love to have you subscribe to cleveland.com. The easiest way to do it is go to cleveland.com slash browns and click on the blue bar at the top. You get all kinds of cool stuff that I won't get into here because we're running over. But thank you all for listening. The podcast continues to grow. We're really glad to have you all along as listeners. And if you want to send us an email and get a question on next week's show, just send it to sports at cleveland.com. Put Terry's talking in the subject line, and we will try and get you on next week's podcast. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week on Terry's Talking.